Sometimes, despite your best efforts, your recovery gets derailed. Powerful life triggers, a lack of support, a wrong turn. Relapse happens, it's frustrating, but the important thing is to not wait another day to get back on track. Foundations Recovery Network is here to help with more than a dozen outpatient programs and six residential treatment centers to choose from. Our co-occurring treatment model gets to the root of your addiction, putting you back on the road to recovery. Call 877-714-1318 to reach our confidential helpline 24-7. We're waiting by the phone. Yo, what's up? This is Jacoby from Papa Roach. This is Ryan Lee. This is Wes. This here. is Bob Ford. This is Rich Roll, and you're listening to Silver Guy Radio. Yo, what's up? Thank you for tuning in today. Thanks to Humans for bringing us in. Thanks to you for supporting the show. I'm Shane Raymer, and you're listening to that Sober Guy podcast. And today we're going to be talking with Patrick Holbert. And Patrick is a former TV producer turned stand-up comedian. Uh, he's appeared on Sirius XM, True TV, The Travel Channel, and was the host host of the internationally syndicated TV show, The Movie Lock, for two years. Uh, Patrick currently has 10 years sober and uh, uses his struggles with alcohol uh, for his brutally honest comedy, uh, which I know is doing a lot for a lot of young people in recovery and uh, all people in recovery out there. And we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, today. And when he's not on stage, he also works as a substance abuse counselor and recovery coach. Uh, we're going to get to Patrick in just a minute. But first, a couple of announcements. Uh, be sure to check us out at thatsoberguy.com for past episodes and resources. Uh, you can also connect with us on Instagram, at Real That Sober Guy, and uh, on Twitter, at Shane Raymer. Uh, let's see, we got a couple of live shows coming up. Uh, Saturday, December 1st at Journey Coffee Company at 7 p.m. That's in Vacaville, California with special guest Wordsmith from Neighborhood Hope Dealer. And uh, also my good homie, Philip Wright. Uh, and then also uh, Shane Raymer and Mark Saratella present That Sober Guy podcast live at the Hollywood Improv January 20th with special guests Darren Prince and Brandon Novak. Uh, so if you want more information about either of those shows, you can go to thatsoberguy.com slash live shows, or if you want to buy tickets uh, directly for the improv show, you can go to improv.com slash Hollywood. And uh, real quick, if you get a minute, go check out my homie Mark Saratella's website. Uh, it's marksaratella.com. Uh, he's funny as shit. He's a good dude. And a big thanks to him for helping to put together uh, this show down in uh, Los Angeles. We're really looking forward to that. Uh, so last thing, and we're going to get to Patrick here. We just launched uh, the How to Navigate the First 90 Days of Sobriety podcast video course. It's about motherfucking time. <laughs> this thing took uh, quite a bit more time than I expected to put together, but I'm, I'm super pumped to, uh, to finally get it off of the ground. Uh, you can get it right now for half off, uh, and that's only 17 bucks if you go to thatsoberguy.com and click on courses. And then um, one last thing, we're giving this course away for free to all veterans. Um, I love our veterans. Um, we all know how many of our veterans struggle with addiction. Uh, so this is really just a small part that Sober Guy can play to help contribute to that cause. So if you're a veteran out there and uh, you want to get the course for free, you can hit me up on Instagram at Real That Sober Guy, or there's a contact form on thatsoberguy.com, uh, and you can uh, let us know that you're a veteran and, and that you'd like to get the course, and we'll hook you up there. Uh, so let's get to Patrick. Patrick, what's up, man? It's so good uh, to have you on the podcast today, man. And I've been looking forward to chatting for a couple of weeks now. How are you? I'm great, man. I'm, I'm so pumped to be on your show and I appreciate it. And uh, man, I, I did my research on your show, but I didn't know how much work you're in the thick of right now. So congratulations on all the live oh. shows and, and that yeah, thank you. podcast. That's, uh, that's amazing. I wish I had that. I didn't know <laughs> what the hell I was doing in my first 90 days. So that's incredible. Yeah, dude. Th thank you so much for, uh, for recognizing that, man. It is, it's been, it's been a lot of work, uh, in a, in a good fashion. And my, my wife, Jess has really been helping out, um, you know, with, with some of the, um, the back end stuff, because it can be a little bit overwhelming at times, yeah. um, as far as the, the work aspect, but yeah, man, good stuff. Lots going on. And, um, like I said, grateful to, to, uh, to be doing it and to be sober. And, yeah. um, so where, let's get to you a little bit, man. Where are you, where are you located? Are you down South or are you in California? Where are you at? I'm in Brooklyn, New York right now. Oh, uh, wow. New York city. Yeah. So, uh, I appreciate you getting up three hours earlier than normal to, uh, make time for me today. It's amazing. Oh yeah, dude. No, good stuff. I've, um, I did one recently, um, with, uh, with Nate, uh, Nathan, um, and he was, 
Uh, he taught, he used to be in the church of Scientology. Oh, wow. and, uh, he's, yeah, he's got a, a pretty crazy story of addiction and uh, recovery and really an amazing, amazing journey and whatnot, but he's in China. And so I think I got up at like 4 a.m. one morning wow. to do. Yeah. So it's funny, man, that the, the time changes, man, we're all over the place. And I think that's one of the cool things about technology. It really allows us to connect. And, and yeah, work, so. this is incredible. I really yeah. appreciate it. So, man, so, um, I mean, what you're, you're a comedian, you're a substance abuse counselor. Um, you yourself have a lot going on. You're very involved in the recovery community. Um, man, let's, let's get to know you a little bit, bro. Like, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I always wanted to be a comic since I was a kid. I, I grew up watching Comedy Central when it first came out. I'm almost 40 now, so, like, I remember when Comedy Central was only stand-up all the time, and I fell in love with it. I knew that's what I wanted to do with my life. And then I got to college and uh, I was 19 when I had my, or 18 when I had my first drinks and uh, I immediately got distracted from my childhood dream. So in sobriety, I reconnected with comedy uh, through maybe in my fifth year sober, I'm 10 years sober now. So about five or six years ago, I started getting up and doing open mics again after uh, not having done them since college and booze really, uh, you know, they really distracted, it distracted me from my, my goal of what I always wanted to do. So, uh, kind of now that my career is finally taking off, um, and I, I joke so much about my, my drinking days and living life sober in my regular shows that I was like, holy cow, I have enough material here to talk about this specific experience, uh, in a, in a, in a specific way. So I put together a show that's only about substance abuse and the warning signs and recovery and all those things are just kind of packaged into one thing. So, yeah. Did you, um, so when you did comedy in college, when you first set or when you first started, at least, um, you were still drinking, right? When you yeah. started. Yeah, I, I was, it, it was literally, I didn't drink in high school cause it, it you know, uh, alcoholism runs in my family. So I was scared of it. And then when I started, I was also doing my first open mics during during college. So they're, both things were happening at the same time, but the the alcohol won yeah. in the, uh, in the battle. Did you did you find that uh, you know and we hear this a lot that you know especially something like like stand up comedy? I mean, any social situation at that too. Beside that, a lot of people use alcohol as a tool to loosen up, to kind of get the blood flowing. You, you feel a little bit more. Um, uh, confident, whatever it is. Was that a part of it for you to kind of get into that? I, you know, for me, it's weird. Cause I was, I was always lucky. Like I, uh, so I'm one of three kids and my brother is also a sober alcoholic. My sister, she, she has bipolar too. So she has some issues of her own. Uh, and I was the middle, I am the middle child and I was always very outgoing even in high school when I did not drink and I consciously decided to not drink. I was really, I was popular. I was the king of my prom. I was the homecoming king. I was all those things because the tool that I use, the coping mechanism I used for being uncomfortable was to be really outgoing and win people huh. over. So when I think other people my age went to alcohol and drugs for that kind of thing, I somehow discovered that I was a funny guy and I could charm people and I could just make a lot of friends that way. But then when I got to college, I... Uh, I didn't feel popular and I felt like an outsider. I didn't know anybody and I kind of just didn't have any excuses anymore for not drinking. So I was like, fuck it, I guess I'll try it. And then it, I immediately fell in love with it. I think yeah. whatever predisposition I had or whatever it, it did click with. Um, so in fact, I could like now I I'm pretty weird on stage, totally sober, nothing in my system. And I, I feel comfortable being kind of wacky and weird. It takes, like I always compare it to dancing at a wedding. Like, you know, when the dance floor is empty and you first go out there and you're sober and you're trying to like get into it. <laughs> After a song or two, you finally, you, I can let go. I know yeah. for a lot of people, they need, they need some chemical support or whatever. Um, so anyway, this is a long answer, but I, I actually, I never needed to extra boost to feel confident the problem is that when I did start drinking, it did make me feel like I was on steroids, like I was a rock star, and I had this insane level of confidence that I thought was cool, but it was actually embarrassing. And uh, I, you know, 
I was telling you before we started recording that I went through my uh, rapper phase. I was trying to become a rapper. <laughs> And like for a guy that looks like me, once I start trying to become a rapper, that's when somebody needs to send me to rehab. I think. <laughs> did you have a uh, Did you have a hip hop name? Yeah, I, I went by. Uh, well, I had a few in college. Um, it was uh, I was heavily influenced by Snoop Dogg, so I was oh yeah, the Diz Nizzle Pat. Uh, <laughs> that's I knew was bad, which I knew was bad, and it was just a joke. <laughs> Uh, but then the serious name that I thought was really kind of cool, trying to tap into the, the nerd core market or something, mm -hmm. uh, I went with Pat Miscellaneous. Oh, uh, I like it. I like it. Also, you know, whatever. Yeah. Whatever. That's fun though, man. Like, you know, and I think like, you know, cause I, I'm a musician myself too, and, and hip hop and reggae and punk rock and all kinds of stuff, man. And that, I think it, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I can compare them, but just from an art form perspective, comedy, writing music, um, even just like you were saying, just being open and, um, and fun and outgoing, um, that's something that um, if, you can, if you can tap into that sober, it's really, really powerful. And at the same time, like you said, I've never heard it put like that before. If somebody's already like that, and then they're going to get on, you know, some, some booze or some Coke or some drug, whatever it is, it is almost like steroids of that personality comes out and it could probably get to a point where it could bug the shit out of people. If you're just yeah. overly whatever, man. I mean, yeah. um, I had a, I had a reputation at work for being a huge Coke head, uh, but I never, I've never, to this day, I've never touched it. Oh, uh, really? <laughs> just alcohol would make me bounce off the walls. You know, I was the guy in public places like climbing up the walls and dancing on the bar and jumping over stuff, like just crazy behavior. And uh, yeah, that, I, I, I certainly don't miss it. It's, it's, so, it's so crazy to me how many, um, how many artists or, or just people who like to create stuff, um, kind of like I was just saying, struggle with addiction. Like I, I always want to know, I, I wish I could yeah. just like jump in brains and just like run around and shit and look at like, what is it? Yeah. Is there something specific? I mean, I don't know if you know anything about that or have a, a thought about I it. Think it's, I think it has to do with energy. Like we creative people have a lot of energy and they want to spend it on something, right? Like we want to make stuff. We want to express yeah. ourselves. We want to be seen. We want to be heard. Uh, sometimes who knows what the motives are? Like, I'll admit some like there's a certain amount of my motive that is narcissistic and I just want to feel loved or get attention that I didn't feel like I got as a kid or something like that. But then there's a really valid motive, which is I just want to uh, express myself and connect with people and yeah. um, make a point and feel like I have something to say that might be able to help someone else. So I think when we are, you know, I assume you're a musician before you got sober like you're a creative guy, you have a lot of energy and you want people to hear it. And I know for me, my drinking, I wanted so badly to be a comedian, but instead I became a rapper. I played in bands and I would, I would drink a lot over the shame I had that I wasn't pursuing the things I actually wanted to be doing. Um, so I think it's, I think it's just like misplaced energy and possibly aggression or fear or whatever that we just keep drinking and using to, um, to make that energy feel like it's doing something. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know if that makes any sense. No, it, it, it does make sense. And I think it's a good point that um, we're so like, we're, we're so, I don't know. I get very, like you said, passionate about creating stuff. And I remember I heard, I think it was Tess Sweet who, who was on the show um, a few episodes back. And she said, one of the things she said that like really, really stood out to me, she goes, if I'm not creating shit, I get depressed. Like if yeah. I'm not in that, if I'm not in that space of trying to make something or do something or whatever, and I could totally relate to that, you know, like I love just making new things and trying, like trying to find new things and write and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I, uh, I don't know if anybody's been on your show and has mentioned the artist way. Have you ever heard of the artist way? I don't think so. Not off the top of my head. So it's this, it's this creative workshop. It's a book. Uh, and it was written by this woman, Julia Cameron, and it's a 12 week book because it's based on the 12 steps. And oh, she doesn't wow. come out and say that it's what it is, but it's like, there's a lot of veiled references to sobriety and the program. 
And anyway, I joke that doing the artist way is the 14th step in the program because huh. uh, it's kind of cliche. A lot of people in recovery end up doing it. And the whole thing is about um, tapping into the creativity or the whatever your inner child wants. And mm. for me, my inner child always wanted to be funny on stage in front of people. And mm. so I worked through this workshop with a group of other sober alcoholics who were all kind of, we were all kind of struggling in our own way at the time. Again, this is like four years into my sobriety. And it's just so powerful to see that all that energy, that creative energy and desire that we have inside of us that gets frustrated by addiction, it can be unleashed in like a really powerful way in sobriety. Um, so yeah, I love, I love, uh, I love talking about this stuff. I could nerd out in a <laughs> funny, boring way about it all day, but no, uh, I can yeah. do, I can, I can do the same, man. And I, I, I love talking about it. I find even too like, uh, cause I, I work in, in, in the corporate world too. And so even when I'm, um, even when I'm in that environment, I'm very open about my past and, you know, and it's like, I don't care if it's, you know, it doesn't matter who it is. Every time I mention it, there's always some, oh, my, my brother or my cousin or me or, you know what I mean? Like, and there, it's, a, it's out there, but the artist way too, um, I took a little note of that. I'm going to check it out and then I'll put the links in the show notes for anyone listening out there, listening out there who wants to uh, check that out too. That sounds really cool. Yeah. Um, also in New York, I don't know if this is, goes for California but there are specific meetings that are like artists in recovery uh in New York there's one at the on the Pratt campus which is like a very famous art school um and then there's and then there's separate from uh AA there are uh uh artists um I think there's artist way workshops that are kind of free and public mm. and uh you can find this stuff anywhere Cause I feel lucky that I found uh, the program because I had now, you know, we get to go to this place and work through our issues in a group setting with people that have the same problem as us. And now I meet so many people. Like I, I know so many comics who they might have addiction issues. They might not, but they definitely need a support group of some kind yeah. and, and they don't, or they can probably find one, but it's not as available or obvious where they should go. Um, so anyway, I just throw that out there that, you could probably like people can find a creative workshop slash support group wherever they live. I, I had no idea that that even existed. Uh, so, I mean, learning, learning new shit every day. And I think that goes, you know, that's a, that's a good example of right now, just putting, when we put ourselves out there, we connect with people, we learn new things, we progress. Um, we learn more about ourselves, all that stuff. I mean, really, really cool. Uh, what, one of the things I wanted to ask you too, uh, before I forget was, um, like when I played in bands and did music and all that stuff before I got sober, um, you know, it was always based around alcohol and drugs. Right. Oh, so yeah. like, it, it, that's what I did. I drank, I got high, we did drugs after, before, like all that stuff. And I'm trying to, you know, like be this, like want to be like rocker rock star yeah. person or whatever. Right. Yeah. Totally just stupid and have no fucking clue who I am. Um, and no sense of reality either. Yeah. So when I go to rehab, and then um, I get out and now I got to be this whole new person. I totally lose that connection to being able to play guitar, to write. And that's ultimately what led me to starting the podcast and that, that want to create. But um, what I wanted to ask you, like, did you experience that? Like, what, are, what was your experience like going from doing some comedy and then that whole process? Yeah, well, the thing that is most fresh in my mind was the music because I was doing... I, I, that's a, what you described was like promoting parties and shows just to put myself in an environment where I'd have free drinks all night. That was so much of the motive of the whole thing. Yeah. And I was like this, like Pat Miscellaneous was a cartoon character. <laughs> he, was, he was this whole other dude, this whole other presence. Like I, I, I was basically like, I wanted to be the fourth beastie boy or something like from the, you know, from the, you got a fight video. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like when I quit drinking, I tried to keep doing those shows and those parties. And I, I got I got sober going to therapy and my therapist did come from the rooms and he he would say like, uh, you know, anything you ever did drunk, you could do sober because I would go to him and I'd be like, how can I how can I keep doing these shows and playing in bands and whatever? 
uh, sober. I don't think I can do that. And he was like, you could definitely do that. It just takes, just takes some extra effort. And, um, so when I, I did play a few more shows, uh, but the problem was that I, uh, yeah, like it, what, like it was so not about being a great rapper for me. It was just like, being this party guy yeah. so I, I played a few more and they were just kind of awkward and also my bandmate was probably my worst enabler and that's a whole complicated thing because it's like when you get sober you have to figure out who your real friends are and are they are they long-term friends and and he's a guy I see him to this day and he's like so are you drinking today or what and I'm like dude <laughs> so anyway um uh, yeah, it, I kind of, I kind of, it just kind of faded away. Like I didn't want to admit it or I didn't know at first that it just like rap just wasn't for me is sort of what I had to come to terms with. But with that said, you know, like two years into sobriety, I probably wrote like 10 or 15 like acoustic songs that yeah. nobody has ever heard, but I'm, I'm still proud of them. I'm proud of like finding a place to put my creative, energy and sort of frustration at that time that's what i needed was to write some like depressing you know <laughs> acoustic uh you know whatever I, I don't even know what they are i i actually haven't listened to them in a while but um i have i have a couple um that i because i took my guitar with me to rehab so i was trying to be the oh i'm in rehab and i'm playing my you know what i mean that whole fucking deal right and i looked back on some of the shit that i wrote and i'm just like good lord like you sorry yeah. son of a bitch like, yeah, yeah, but yeah. you know you're in the moment you know what i mean and like you said like i i guess i am kind of proud of that like being able to express myself and whatever but it's just yeah. um it's hard for me to like take it serious almost when i look back on it now it's a little yeah. weird I mean, I gotta say though, like, it's so, it's such a good, like, that's such a good instinct though to like, no matter how over dramatic the feeling is, like, sometimes it's really good to just lean into it completely and just like say it out loud or sing it out loud, write it down, write a poem or whatever, like, really, really go into it. Obviously, with support, like, like, make sure you're like not getting lost in those things or kicking up like major regrets or guilt or shame that are gonna make you use again. But I think all that artistic expression is so good to like really let yourself fall into, yeah. you know? So what, what do you, what do you work on um, uh, for your bits or a full routine or what, what does that look like uh, for you, man? I'm just curious, like your writing process and you know, what are, you said most of your routine is all based around recovery, which I think yeah. is so cool. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I just talk about what's going on in life. You know, like I, I married a woman I met in the program and she's, she's the funny one in our marriage, to be honest. And we're constantly just like cracking jokes around the house. And uh, a lot of, you know, when I started, when I started doing comedy, I was just talking a lot about our relationship and what was going on with that. Cause that was like, uh, that, that's the most immediate thing yeah. that creates both, frustration and uh you know annoyance and pain and whatever obviously love and excitement and all good things but uh i just process things that are troubling me with jokes as much as possible and then i just kept kind of kept writing about how we met and um some you know i'll just write out long stories that are funny like you know i've got a couple of rests in my story and uh, some behaviors that were shocking when I was a drinker, you know, I was the naked guy at parties and <laughs> I about that. Uh, so it's really, I just, I do part of the artist way is um, you journal every day for three pages in a notebook mm -hmm. and no matter what you just sit and you write, uh, you know, I've got hundreds of 10 steps I've done that way. I've got tons of like, what did I do yesterday type things. And then I've got lots of just old stories that I'll just develop in a notebook. And um, yeah, it just kind of leads to these little nuggets of, uh, of, of funny things. Um, and you know, with comedy, you go to open mics all the time. So in my first few years of doing it, I was going to two or three open mics a night and just kind of talking things out. And then once I found one thing that was funny, figure out a way to build on that. Um, and like, I, uh, I'm kind of a nerd. I like, I like a school setting. Like if I could afford it, I would go to college classes still, you know? Um, so I, I did a couple workshops. I took a, a few improv classes and just sort of learned the, 
science behind taking a, a funny story and kind of making it into a bit and like writing proper punchlines and things like that. Mm. So, that's really cool. Really, really cool. And, and so speaking of college though, too, you're actually, are, are you touring or you go around? I, I think you're, you're yeah. touring, right? At colleges and just talking to college kids about recovery and don't be a dumbass and fuck your life all up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I have this, um, I call it like a, a Ted talk of shame. Uh, <laughs> one man, it's a one man show that's uh, primarily stand up comedy and storytelling, but also some uh, statistics and, uh, you know, just data for to present to college students. It's called Punchline Drunk. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I, I just perform it for, uh, I tell my story about how I always wanted to be a comedian. Then I got drunk for 10 years and now I'm back and uh, and how I live my life now. Um, and yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting talking to, like I did a show a couple weeks ago up in Westchester, New York, and it was for all the fraternities and sororities and sports teams on campus. And it was 500, you know, 18 to 22 year old young people. And, uh, you know, I'm up there giving a PowerPoint presentation. I got to admit, it's hard to not feel like a nerd telling them like, oh, you, nobody can drink. But that's, yeah. that's not the point of the show. The point is I just talk about what happened to me. Uh, you know, I, basically the what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now format. And um, I just basically put it out there like, if you think maybe you have a problem, it's definitely worth investigating and asking for help if you need it. Um, and yeah, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I'll talk, I'll talk to people after the show, we'll do Q&As, and uh, they'll, they'll see places that they related to me. Uh, I meet other, you know, you know, one guy was like, yeah, that my buddy over there, he's the naked guy at the party, you know, like, so it's, it's cool to see people uh, kind of relating to it in that way. So you, you get a pretty good response and it sounds like, like people are like actually reaching out and uh, you know, it's, it's hard for, it's hard for a lot of people to talk about. And I would imagine for college kids, uh, yeah. you know, that's, that's somewhat of a stigma and tough thing to discuss probably. Yeah, because I'm not coming in like a dare officer, you know, like, because I, you know, I'm not an authority. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not a doctor. Like, I, I show that, like, my PowerPoint has pictures of, of me hanging off trees and shit like that. Like, yeah. I'm clearly an idiot. so real. Yeah. yeah. Real. So they, uh, they, they see me as just like another, another dude. I think I have a few more years of appearing to be youthful. So, <laughs> I think once I, you know, once I look like a substitute school teacher, then maybe they won't buy it as much, but, uh, you got to have the khakis, maybe get yourself a fanny pack, yeah, exactly. tuck the shirt in. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, that's funny, man. Um, man, dude, how we, how are we on time right now? What do we got? We, you're, uh, you're still I got good, like right? another 20, 20 minutes. minutes. Uh, okay, yeah, cool. I, told you after, I, I, I go to therapy. I'm a huge believer in that. Yeah. Uh, what, yeah. What's that like? Uh, actually, you know, I can't believe we're talking about this so much, but she, I specifically found her because uh, I was looking for an art therapist. Um, mm. Oh, this is, it. yeah, this is, I was doing a show in the Bronx and I was on stage. I was on stage for like a half hour and I was just like, at one point I said, damn, I need to go back to therapy. Just like off the cuff, just yeah. whatever. And this woman after the show said, hey, I'm a therapist. I can refer you to somebody. Uh, and I was like, well, I'm looking for an art therapist. And she was like, that's what I do. And I can find you one. And I, that's how I met my current therapist. And wow. she, we talk a lot about, uh, like comedy and confidence and self-esteem and all those, all the issues that like make, uh, recovery difficult or lead us into deeper addiction are all issues that trigger me in a way that, uh, can be kind of scary as an artist, you know, like if I'm not feeling great about uh, my career or my material or my, how the show went last night or whatever, that kind of puts me in a, in a vulnerable place. So do you, uh, do you still uh, get, do you still get those urges and trigger even after 10 years? Yeah, not, not for booze. I mean, I'll admit like there, I, I one of my closest buddies, he, uh, I see him a few times a week. He's, he's a whiskey drinker. And I'll admit, sometimes I will seek out a conversation with him because I just want to smell it. Uh, <laughs> Whiskey. <laughs> yeah, which is not, probably not the healthiest thing in the world. Like, I'll get triggered in the sense of like, oh, I'll, 
oh, that smells good. Or, yeah. you know, weed, you, you can have weed on you in New York now. And like, I'll walk through clouds of smoke and yeah. that smells delicious sometimes. Uh, luckily, I don't get triggered to the point where I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm getting fucked up tonight. Uh, the danger zone for me when it comes to being triggered is about like uh, the other stuff, you know, like, like girls and women and uh, just like wanting attention from people in whatever right. form it takes and trying to figure, you know, just wanting to get a high in a way that I sort of manipulate situations to get. Um, mm. So like, I, I have to do that thing sometimes of like, all right, my set is over. I'm still at the bar. Do I really need to still be here talking to these people? Yeah. Um, do, you know, I, I gotta be careful about that kind of stuff. Um, Sounds so, like you're pretty, you're pretty aware of that though, which is, which is good. I mean, you kind of know your boundaries and what, what's, you know, okay. And what's not okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it, it n none of it will ever go away. Like I, you know, of course, like we all want to feel serene and we all want to um, be balanced and whatever, but there's always going to be stuff like junk food is a huge problem for me right now. Like last night uh, I came home, I, uh, I had a Snickers makes these ice cream bars. I got one of those and then I got an ice cream sandwich, like old school ice cream sandwich. I put them both in a bowl and I just like chopped it up with a spoon. <laughs> and I put, I took, this is where it gets crazy. I took the wrappers and I hid them inside the deli bag that it came from. And I stuffed that to the bottom of the garbage can so that my wife wouldn't know that that's the garbage I ate before she got home. Uh, so Bro, this I'm, I'm only laughing because I, I, I'm not shitting you. I, I think I, was a carbon copy of the exact words you just said like a week ago in step study. Same shit. Mine was with Halloween candy. It wasn't with ice cream, but yeah, bro. It's uh, why is that? Like, yeah. what is it about that? I just want to feel different. I want to, um, you know, I came home from, I, I went to a meeting too. So this week I've been to like 11 meetings in the last 10 days, I think. Cause I, I felt myself sort of drifting and falling off the beam a little bit. So, I guess, you know, what was it? I came home, I was watching TV. I think, I, honestly, like, so I've been feeling a little bit of um, writer's block, and I, I planned to get a lot of stuff done yesterday, and it just didn't feel like I did. So I think I just didn't want to feel that feeling, and sugar is a fucking hell of a drug, you know? <laughs> and it makes you feel like, oh, now I'm, now I'm happy. This is a pleasure. Like, it's so it's such a pleasure to put in the body. Oh yeah. Uh, so I'm trying to replace that with the gym, which is something I'm experiencing for the first time in my life. Uh, it, actually having a positive chemical, uh, payoff. Um, but yeah, that felt last night felt, it felt like dirty and kind of like, yeah. And you, you wake up, you feel all shitty, all like, like you're hung over on like shit, like junk food or sugar. It's funny that actually, I mean, for me at least it actually gives me, like I can feel it if I eat a bunch of crap before bed, which I do sometimes because it's like, oh, I'm just going to have a long day. I'm just going to veg out on the couch and just yeah. eat myself and f destroy myself and feel like, ah, oh, shit. And then yeah. you wake up and you just feel like terrible. It's not like a full hangover. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, yeah, you can get the fuck it's with, because I remember being like, you know what, fuck it. I'm just calling out of work tomorrow. I'm, I'm going to have my 10th beer. I don't give a shit. Yeah. We'll deal with the, the, the repercussions in a couple of days, you know? And you, I can get that way with many things in sobriety. Uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's tricky. Well, I, 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 cha I changed course on us, but let me just jump back to the therapy thing real quick because yeah. you kind of got into it. So is that having um, a really – you know, big impact on, on not just your recovery, but maybe just life in general for you? Yeah. Cause I, I, uh, in a huge way, you know, like I went to this guy, the guy I went to when I first got sober, we worked together for like four years and that was all about like sobriety. He, he, he did finally get me to go to meetings and that's when my life changed so much. Hmm. Uh, and it was so much about, uh, like the, the drinking and the thinking and the history and all that stuff. And now this woman I go to, I told her from the start, I, I wanted more of a, like a life coach experience. Like I want to be able to just bounce ideas off of her and her help me with what the next best action is or approach is. 
Yeah. And, um, you know, like emailing you is, is a, was a direct uh, result of working with her where it's like, I want to share my story with more people. I want people to know about this project I'm working on. So I've yeah. got to reach out to people that can help. And I, th that kind of proactivity is just all comes from working with her where the major theme of our work together is like me reminding myself that I deserve to uh, talk about myself. I deserve to get paid for the work that I do. Yeah. I deserve to chase this dream. Uh, Cause so much of what my brain tells me is like, why do you think you're so special? Why do you, what do you think you have to offer that someone else doesn't? And if someone does want you to perform for them, why do you think you deserve to get paid for it? Like they, they're giving you this exposure. They're giving you this opportunity. Like what makes you so special that you deserve to try to pay your rent with this and all, all those funky ideas. And uh, so a lot of, a lot of that, it's all like self-esteem related. Um, so, so much of the work I do with her is about that. Uh, and it does help a lot because, um, you know, I, I think the program, sometimes I've warped some of the language in my, during my time being sober. Like I did actually, I joined two bands in like my four or five year range or maybe earlier three, four year range. And I was playing drums. I, I took drum lessons because I had all this free time. And I was like, you know what? I'll join a band and I'll play drums as an exercise in ego management is what I told myself. I'll stay right sized by not putting myself up front and I'll play drums in the back and I'll be of service to this band. Yeah. And I love doing it because I actually love to learn drums and I you know, just love music and it, I, I enjoyed playing. But I realized that I was lying to myself that I didn't want the attention that a lead singer would get or a rapper or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so, it, so basically she helps me uh, know that my instincts are correct. Like it's totally fine that I want to be the guy on stage talking at a room of 500 people like, and yeah. that there's nothing wrong with that. Like that's actually, that is me doing what, uh, the universe wants me to be doing or God or whatever. Um, yeah, bro. It's uh, two, two good things there. Um, and number one, thank you for sharing that too, because I, that's, you know, the honesty in that in like the, I, I went straight to the word worthy when I heard you talking about that. Like I'm, you know, I'm not, I walk into church sometimes and I just feel like, God, I'm, I'm not worthy to be here. Why am I here? You know what I mean? Like why, or same thing, a show, you know, how, what makes me think I'm special or I'm up here, I'm supposed to be able to do this. And that little voice up there, dude, that's what kills. That's what killed my creativity and my drive and my passion, all that stuff for a long time. And I know it kills a lot of other people's and getting out of that is something that's huge. And, and so here's the second point I wanted to make is the importance of having a coach, of having a group, of having community around us. I can't do this shit on my own. I know you can't do it on your own because you just are, are talking about it. And, you know, to those out there listening, like there's nothing weak or um, wrong or anything with reaching out for help and having a team around you to help support you in what you do. Like that's how we succeed. That's how we get better. That's how we grow and saying like, okay, I'm cool that I don't know this right now, but hey, I really want to learn. How do I learn? How, how, how do I go about that? You know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's yeah. really some good stuff. Yeah. And then like doing that in a program, in, in the program, like you, you know, they tell you to look out for people who have what you want, like people yeah. that are living a life in sobriety that you admire and you look up to and you kind of, you, you ask them how they did it. Right. And then that tra that model transfers to all aspects of life. Like you, you find somebody who's doing what you want to do and you you know, there's so many resources to find out how somebody did something. Like you can yeah. listen to podcasts or read their interviews or whatever, and just, just follow, take the next right action toward that thing. Um, but yeah, I, I always, I, I always kind of, I think there's certain parts of the program that we can kind of warp to actually end up working against us. So like yeah. people talk about being humble and right sized. Sometimes the humble move is to be like, Hey, I can, I can, put on music. I, I can play that show. I can, I can write that song like that. That's the humble thing. Huh. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, let's see. I know we got a few, we got a few minutes still, I think. Um, what, um, what is your, 
Well, two things. I want to know a little bit about what your recovery program looks like for those out there listening who might just be wondering, well, what does Patrick do? Like, how does he kind of stay sober? I know you mentioned the artist way already. So that, and then what do you think is like the number one or, or one of the top things that really helps you to, to stay on the straight and narrow through, through your, your journey? Yeah. Uh, so I, I, AA is my main source of recovery. So I go to, I go to AA meetings. Um, and like I said, this, this last 10 days have been to quite a few, uh, which has not been the case over the last couple of years. I, I was sort of in a place where I was going like once every two weeks, maybe. And, uh, you know, cause so much of my life is built around, uh, recovery. Like I married a woman in recovery, our inner circle of friends are all in recovery. Those people, many of them are having children now. So it's like our, like really our family life, our chosen family life is so much about recovery. So I would, I say all that just to kind of make the point that it's about community and um, being in a community, like you mentioned. Yeah. Um, therapy is huge. I go to individual therapy with, with the woman I mentioned. And then I, I actually go to couples therapy also every couple of weeks. And that oh. is amazing for maintaining our marriage. Um, and then, um, yeah, I guess cre just creating uh, is so – like staying consistent with my work is uh, really important to me and um, probably helps me stay sober. Uh, I, I feel like if I were to ever get really blocked or really frustrated, I would be and – I, and I started avoiding it or something. I think that could put me in the danger zone. Yeah. Um, I think those are the questions – you asked. Uh, yeah, no, no, that's, that's good. And I, I just, I love the fact that like you, you, you have a solid team around you from your, from your marriage to the work that you do to your personal recovery. Um, and I just, I can't say that enough. It's like, it's, it's one of the, the solid foundational things of just trying to be a better human being, I think is surrounding ourselves. And like with a lot of, of people I talk to or, um, you know, know personally, you know, that block there, I don't know what it is. Is it, do we call it stigma? Whatever it is that just says either you don't need that. You're not like those people. That's not going to help you. You got this. You can do this shit on your own. And it's that I just want to say like, that is just not, it's just not true. At least for me, it's not. And I, and I know you're, you're an example of that too. You're not doing this stuff alone, you know? Yeah. And what I'll say is like, that's a natural inclination to feel that way. And I, I felt like I went to meet, so I didn't go to meetings at all for six months. I went to therapy once a week and then I did start going to meetings six months in, but I didn't talk to anybody. And I went about once a week and I was like, I'll listen. And I actually liked them cause I liked listening to the stories and I yeah. related, but I was like, I don't want to talk to these people yet. I was felt really shy basically. And then, uh, and then it took until I had a year to finally ask somebody to sponsor me. And even then it took like time to start meeting people and making friends. Uh, so it can be slow. But what I always say is like, if you're, if you really want to find a way to live a sober life and you think you need recovery uh, and you think it will save your life, just hang in there and go to a bunch of meetings and, and let it happen. And, uh, and, and also be brave, introduce yourself to people um, and I got to, you know, like last night it was a, I was at a meeting where it was someone's first meeting ever and talking to him afterward gave me such a lift, uh, yeah. that it, it changed my mood altogether. And, uh, you know, by introducing yourself to somebody after the meeting, like it can, it can, I don't know, there's something magic that happens between two alcoholics or addicts talking about whatever. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you just got to. Talk to yeah, that's like some someone who's new out there. You might not think. Well, number one, you're scared to go to a meeting, and you also might think, and I know this from personal experience, that I don't. What the hell do I have to offer these people? I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I'm just a drunk, or I'm just a drug addict, whatever. No, that's not true. Like you just you just said that when you go there, there's there is something magical about that. Like no matter how many years somebody has, you know what that does for me? I just had five years. When I see someone who comes in fresh man, it reminds me of what it was like because it's so easy for me to forget what it was like. And because, you know, different things, time, all that stuff. And yeah. man, we all have something to offer. So uh, it's good stuff, bro. Uh, Punchline Drunk, a sober comedian discusses addiction, man. So awesome uh, work that you're doing. Where can folks find more information if they want to reach out to you about uh, comedy, the work you're doing, uh, whatever, man, where can they reach yeah. out? 
Yeah, I would just say check out my website, uh, www.patrickholbert.com. Uh, you can hit find my Instagram through there, and then there's a page on my site for Punchline Drunk, and that has a link to this YouTube trailer I made about it. So uh, it's if people want to find me, they can check that out. And also my Twitter's on there and stuff. So, yeah, I would say just check out the website. Right on, man. Dude, uh, it's, been a, it's been really cool talking to you, man. I'm so stoked we got to connect. and um, and. Yeah, hopefully we get to do it again, man. Yeah, thanks, Shane. I'm I'm in LA uh, doing shows from February 3rd until February 10th. So nice. I'll, I'll come find you, or uh, you know, maybe we can sync up or something like that. Hey, dude, I w- I would love that. Um, I'm up in uh, the Bay Area, um, oh, okay. but it's still. I mean, I, I drive. You can drive down there in in less than a day. So uh, yeah, please, we'll we'll definitely connect, man. Well, hopefully, I'll be um, up there sometime too. San Francisco, Sacramento, a lot of comedy clubs. So yeah, that'd be, that'd yeah, be great. Yeah. Well, thanks for tuning in today, folks. Uh, uh, you can connect with us, uh, go to that sober Also on Instagram at real that sober guy at Shane Raymer on Twitter. Um, if you need some help, you have uh, lots of resources on our website. Also, you can call foundations recovery network. They have a private confidential line. It's 877-714-1318. Peace, love, respect, and keep your blood clean.